all up, and you've now heard all of my Croatian. Uh, so, uh, so I hate to talk about myself. Um, I'm just not comfortable doing that. I love to talk about what I do, but um, Robert was telling me not everybody was here Monday, and so I need to talk about myself a little bit to explain why I'm here, where I came from, and who I am. So we're going to do that just kind of briefly. Um, I'm a police officer in the United States, and I've been a police officer for about 27 years, so longer than many of you have been alive. Um, and I started off as a uniformed police officer in America. I drove a police car, blue lights, and arrested people, and took them to jail, and got in car chases, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I did that for a while, and then I got promoted to detective. And so as a detective, uh, you work a little bit of everything. So I worked theft cases, auto thefts, and burglaries, and um, forged checks, and just pretty much everything. Uh, and I finally worked my way into homicide, so I started doing a homicide investigation. I went to work for the state police in Georgia. It's called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. I spent most of my career as a special agent with the GBI. Um, and I worked kind of the northeast corner of the state of Georgia, which is a very large area. And we worked, I don't know, I've worked probably five, six hundred homicides in my career. Um, and so I spent most of my career doing that. I left the GBI about seven years ago, and I went to work for Gwinnett County Police. Gwinnett County is a suburb of Atlanta, um, and I got hired to be the crime scene unit commander. So I had 20 full-time crime scene investigators that worked for me in Gwinnett. Um, Gwinnett County was a very busy county, um, very, very diverse um, county from an ethnic perspective. We have areas of town that are Korean. We have areas of town that are heavily Hispanic. We have an Eastern European area of town. Um, and so um, we also have a lot of crime that goes with that. Uh, we worked about 45 homicides a year just in Gwinnett County, the one county that I was working in. So um, very busy. I've been doing this for a long time. I've, you know, over the course of my career, um, I spent some time as a member of the SWAT team. Um, and I was a firearms instructor, I teach people to shoot. So if you want to talk about that stuff, I love to talk about guns um, <laughs> and, uh, and shooting and, and training officers and all those types of things. Um, now, like I said, I, I'm actually the chief of a very small department in the North Georgia area. Um, I, uh, I spent some time working in the courts. I do expert testimony. So I've been qualified as an expert witness. And, and in America, and I'm assuming it's similar here, if you're going to bring somebody into the courtroom and have them talk about a particular topic and give an opinion, they have to be qualified as an expert. So I've been qualified as an expert in crime scene investigations and firearms and fingerprints. Um, and so I do a good bit of that. So that's kind of how I ended up here um, doing this. And so uh, this and because they asked me to come. And uh, so, uh, so we, you know, Monday night, for those of you here Monday, you know, we talked about Monday night, I primarily, we talked about kind of the fundamentals of crime scene. I know there's American television here and American movies are here. So people see CSI, Law and Order and Criminal Minds and Bones and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's not always an accurate portrayal of what we do. Um, and so... You know, hopefully I can clear some myth up about what happens. I mean, they're entertaining shows. They're made to entertain. They're not made really to inform. So as we approach Easter, um, and in the Christian world, and I'm a Christian, um, un unapologetically. Um, so in, in the Christian world, as we approach Easter, Easter is our, is our big holiday. Um, and I say that because, I mean, it should be the biggest holiday. In the United States, Christmas is the biggest holiday because it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with selling stuff and buying presents. Um, but, you know, Easter, it's the holy holiday for Christians. It's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, which is very interesting because as you look at the, the story of this, this man, Jesus, you have to ask yourself a question. If, if what he says is not true, then he's of no consequence. But if what he says is true, then he's of a lot of consequence. And so that's a decision that we all kind of have to make. And some people say, oh, I don't believe that. I'm apathetic or I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic or whatever. How we all define ourselves. And so, you know, I look at it as a homicide detective. Um, what happened to this person? You know, he, he was on this earth and then he was gone. And so what happened? How does that get there? Much of what we're going to talk about tonight is based on a couple of books. And you have one of them at your table. They, these are yours to take home. 
Um, these are written by a guy named J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace was a homicide detective in California, the United States. And so he has written several books. I have a couple of them here with me. Um, so much of what I'm going to talk about is detailed much more in the books. You know, this is kind of like the movie. You know, you read the book, and the book's always better than the movie. Um, so this same here. The book's better than me talking. Um, so if you have time, and we're not going to keep you here all night, but I want to talk about it. So if we're going to look at what happened to this person, we're going to talk about a couple of things and see what can we draw, what kind of conclusions can we draw. First of all, I want to talk about bias. Would you agree with me that we all have bias about different things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. So if you're going to investigate something, you have to ask yourself, what is my bias? Do I have a bias that I need to address as I'm looking at something? So a couple of things we talked about here. Philosophical naturalism. I love to use this. It's a big fancy word. I did not come up with it, by the way. But philosophical naturalism is what you most many of you here believe this, and you may not even know what the definition is. And you definitely will hear this in your science classes. And you tell me if this sounds accurate. The presuppositional belief that only natural laws can operate in the world. Does everybody agree with that? That there are only natural laws. Everything in this world abides by a certain natural order. I mean, you can agree it's okay. You can shake your head and go, yeah, that's what I think. Because that's what we hear. I mean, that's what I grew up being taught in school. Okay? And nothing exists beyond the natural realm. So some people believe that. So if that's your belief, then it's kind of hard to get beyond the thing. Well, how, how could this guy that they say could, had miracles? You know, how did he do that? And that's my next question. Can there be any historical evidence that can demonstrate a miracle? Can there be forensic evidence of a miracle? Can I prove that Jesus walked on water? You know, that's an interesting question, right? So we're going to think about that. Does our bias allow us to eliminate certain forms of evidence? Am I biased on, like, I'm, I refuse to listen to certain things? Like, in the United States, we're very big sports fans. We have American football. It's different than the football you have here. It's not a round ball. I had all this debate. I'm, I don't know why we call it football, but we do. Um, but we're very supportive of our teams, you know. So I support the University of Georgia. It's where I went to college, and that's my sports team. So if somebody comes and talks to me and they say they're from the University of Florida, I have a natural bias. I don't care what they have to say. Their team's bad, mine's good, and, you know, every time. And that's just my natural bias. And so I think a lot of times we have that. And religion gets that bias a lot. A lot of times people talk to me and they throw out the word Jesus and you go, ooh, crazy religious person. You know, uh, whatever they have to say is going to be all skewed. And so we want to take a look at some things from a homicide investigative standpoint, not from a churchy standpoint. I don't know if church is a word, but I made it up. <laughs> okay. All right. And we wanted to find science. Because, again, in the crime scene world, forensics, we're all about science. That's what we're here for. So we're going to define science as the systematic, rational examination of a phenomenon. Does that make sense? That's how we get systematic, rational, that's science. But then there's another word we want to throw out here. Scientis scientism. The refusal to consider anything other than natural causes. Because that's the question I have is... If you put a scientific application to something and you look at it and you say, okay, I can't apply a scientific principle to explain this particular phenomenon, are you willing to say, well, there might be something outside of a scientific principle? And that's the challenge I find that most people have. Most people say, well, no, if it doesn't follow one of the scientific laws, then, then I can't explain it. Well, if you can't explain it, does that mean it didn't happen? And so we want to talk about, are we willing to take that leap in our mind and go, hey, I'm going to actually have an open mind. I'm going to open my mind to say, I'm going to look at every possible explanation. And as a homicide investigator, that's what I have to do. I walk into a crime scene, there's a dead body on the floor. If I go in there with my mind already made up, well, I know what happened. That's going to be a problem because if I do that, I'm going to miss things or I'm going to come to a wrong conclusion based on what I'm looking at. So having an open mind is kind of the key for us in crime scene to doing a good job. All right, so we're going to talk about manners of death for a moment. This is actually a death scene. Um, and do, you, do you want a clicker? Uh, that's okay. This has got a laser pointer, though, so I can play with the laser. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's cat chasing around. So, so um, and see, right now, Jim Lee's heart rate just went up like 20 beats because he hasn't seen this presentation, and he had to edit a bunch of photos out of my last one. But I made this one all by myself, and no one's looked at it yet. Yeah. So, yeah. So Jim's like, oh no. Yeah. So no, there's actually a dead body. He's right there in this one. So this is actually this is a crime scene um, in the United States. Uh, this was a shooting that I worked. And so we have a deceased individual right here. That's my crime scene truck. Ah, oh, my battery just died in the point. No fun. 
Uh -huh. right. So anyway, this is my crime scene truck that I was driving at the time. This was the local sheriff's department, and I would go assist them uh, with various things. So when we talk about manners of death, there's basically four manners of death. And every death that has ever occurred in the world falls into one of these four manners. Okay? Natural. Natural causes. Disease, old age, heart failure, you know, whatever the case may be, natural causes. And that's what we kind of all hope we end up um, dying from natural causes. Accidental. In the United States, we see this a lot in car accidents. You know, but they could be, there's lots of different times. There's heavy machinery, equipment, you know, but accidental death um, is a manner of death. Now, manners of death differ from causes of death. So, if I told you somebody's cause of death was a gunshot wound, that could be in different manners. Could a gunshot wound be an accident? Yeah, sure. Could it be a homicide? Could it be a suicide? Yeah. So, cause of death and manner of death are two different things. So suicide is simply a death that occurred as a result of the person's own actions. They intentionally took their own life. And then homicide is somebody took the life of another person. Now, if you commit a homicide, do you go to jail? Not necessarily. Okay, not necessarily. Yeah, so you're like, yeah, so you're like, not necessarily. So, yeah, homicide is not a crime. Murder is a crime. Homicide is the manner of death. So if someone is attacking you and you defend yourself and you kill them, that's a homicide, but it's what in America we call it a justifiable homicide. I'm sure Croatia has a similar law um, that says you can protect yourself, you can protect other people. So not every homicide is a crime. So you kind of have to understand the basic fundamentals of how that works as we're looking at you know, different types of crime. So those are our manners of death. So every death falls into one of those manners. So we're going to talk about something called abductive reasoning. Um, this may be something you, you, you've heard deductive reasoning. This is a little bit different. So if I have a body at a crime scene, and it's face down, it's cold to the touch, it's unresponsive, it's stiff, they're dead. What is my manner of death? We don't know, right? Yeah, there's not enough information at this point to determine what has happened to this person. So right now, it could be natural. Could be suicide, could be homicide, could be accidental. We don't know. So as we start looking and start developing facts of the case, a new fact comes in. There's a pool of blood coming from the abdomen of this person who's face down. So is there a natural opening that blood should be running out of in your abdomen? Yeah, shake your heads like this. Those of you anatomy physiology people, you know. Right. So it shouldn't be bleeding. So at this point, it's probably not a natural cause. I'm not ready to rule it out yet, but at this point I'm thinking from, from looking at what's the most probable explanation. Natural's looking pretty low on the list at this point. So as I continue to look more into my case, I find there's a large knife sticking out of the lower back. Now, the crime scene, we call that a clue. Right? <laughs> okay, so we got a large knife sticking out of their back, pool of blood on the floor, they're face down. How are you feeling about natural cause of death at this point? No. Yeah, pretty, pretty low, right? <laughs> pretty low on the list. Now, how are you feeling about suicide at this point? No. Is it possible? Can I take a knife and stab myself yeah, in the back? It's it's weird. Yeah, it's weird, right? It's possible. Yeah, so if you apply what we call abductive reasoning, we're looking at, we're going to take a set of facts or set of observations and say, what is the most reasonable explanation for that? Okay. So as we continue to look at this, we're going to look into, there's some additional stab wounds in the uh, other area of the back. So now they have multiple stab wounds. So what are we going to call this at this point? Homicide. Homicide. Yeah, we probably need to be opening a homicide investigation, right? Where you all have now just passed the abductive reasoning test. I've taken a simple set of facts, and I've applied those facts to, you know, what is the most probable, most logical reasoning to the, what I'm trying to find out, the answer I'm trying to reach. Um, so it's not a complicated process. But what happens oftentimes is we go in with these presuppositions and these biases of, oh, I know what happened. Um, I have a, I didn't put it in my photo, I should have put it. I got a call one day. Uh, as a crime scene investigator, you're on call all the time. And so my phone rings, I answer the phone, they say, hey Jeff, we need you to be in route for a crime scene. I said, okay, what do you got? They go, a uh, guy called 911, which is like 122, is that right? 112. 112, I can never get that right here. <laughs> so it's like 112 in the US. And he, he calls and he says, hey, I just came home for, I've been out of town for the weekend and I found my wife, she's dead in the freezer. And I'm like, no, okay, yeah, this is going to be good. So I'm driving over there going, yeah, this guy killed his wife. There's no, there's no doubt about it. 
Um, and we end up working the scene, and it ends up he did not kill his wife. She fell. They had like a, a chest freezer. So the freezer has a lid that opens up, right? You know, it's just on the floor like a box. You yeah. put cold things in there. And her, uh, it was very hot summertime in Georgia. And uh, she was opening the freezer and sitting on top of it to cool off. And she was drinking vodka and eating Oreos, which I thought was a weird combination. But anyway, she's eating Oreos and drinking vodka, and she fell into the freezer. And the actual cause of death was what we call positional asphyxia. When she fell into the freezer, her lungs couldn't expand to fill up with air. She was stuck, and she died, and she froze. So her manner of death is what? Accidental. Yeah. And so it's accidental. But I left the house on the way over there going, yeah, there's no way this is not going to be a homicide. And so you have to kind of train yourself. I'm going to take my time, and I'm going to you know, try to keep an open mind as I approach. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about types of evidence. Okay. So when you start talking about eyewitnesses, we put people on the stand and we testify to things. We have courts. Now, in the United States, we have a jury um, for our trial. So if we accuse someone of a crime, they go to court. There's a judge, and the judge presides over the hearing and makes sure that all the information is, is brought in the proper way. But the jury makes the decision on guilt or innocence. And a jury is just 12 people that weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty. Um, and uh, come on, they don't get any better than this. So, you don't know, have to laugh. No, so uh, so the, all 12 jurors have to be in agreement that someone is guilty. That's the way the system works in the United States. So when we bring evidence in front of the court, you know, people come in to testify, there's two classifications of evidence. There's circumstantial and there's direct. Um, and you probably have something very similar here. And you'll hear defense attorneys love to argue about circumstantial evidence. So I'm going to give you two examples that are pretty simple. If Jim Lee walks in here and he says, hey, I was outside and it's raining. That's direct evidence. Okay? Jim is telling me what he saw, what he directly observed. That's direct evidence. Okay, but let's say Donald Goy walks in here, and he doesn't say anything to me, but he's wearing a raincoat, and it has water droplets all over it, and he has an umbrella in his hand, and he's shaking the umbrella off as he comes in. That's circumstantial evidence that it's raining. Which one of those is more reliable? The second one. The second one? Why? Well, let's see, I get a first one, I get a second one, so yeah. Make your case. Why is, the, why is direct more reliable? Okay, so he could have poured water on himself, because that's something Jim would do. <laughs> right? Or he could be lying, right? Okay? So, circumstantial evidence, does it guarantee that it's raining outside just because he's wet? Because someone had poured water on Donald Boy? Let's say Donald Boy was walking in, and Mallory was up in the window of the hotel pouring water out. Just a hypothetical situation. Okay. And I happen to have an umbrella. And you happen to have an umbrella and you got wet. <laughs> so, the, right. So the question again is, you know, there's two different types of evidence. Direct evidence completely depends on the credibility of the witness. Do we believe what they have to say? And that's a jury decision. Jury has to go, oh, I believe this person or I do not believe this person. So it's all about credibility. Um, defense attorneys like to argue that they don't like circumstantial evidence, that it's not good evidence. Um, and, which is not true, but again, that's a defense attorney's job is to defend their client. So we get more circumstantial evidence than we get direct evidence. Why would that be? Anybody want to take a guess? We get lots of circumstantial evidence. I don't get lots of direct. Well, I would have to say that there are no direct evidence because if a crime had to be made perfect, then I guess there would be no evidence of those kind that would imply the person is guilty. Right. So, generally speaking, when people are going to commit a crime, they don't do it with witnesses around, right? I mean, <laughs> that makes sense. They're not, hopefully, no, no one's watching them is what they think. So, we don't get as much direct evidence as we get circumstantial evidence. I was trying a burglary case. Um, burglary, does that make sense? Yeah. You got it? Okay. I never know how things translate. And sometimes they have these blank stares like anything. So, if something doesn't make sense, you can go, hey, Jeff, I don't get it. You know. But we had a guy who was burglarizing houses, breaking into houses and stealing things. And we didn't see him in the house. We didn't catch him in a house. That's great when that happens, but it doesn't usually work out that way. Uh, but we, we, had a, we have pawn shops. Do you have pawn shops here? Places yeah. you can sell you yeah. use things. So we had a record at the pawn shop where he was selling the stolen property from the burglaries at the pawn shop. 
We also had a, um, a witness who saw his vehicle in the area where one of the burglaries had occurred. So we had put a case together, we had arrested him, brought him to trial. And the defense attorney was arguing to the jury that the, our case was circumstantial. That, you know, case circumstantial, you can't convict my client. And the uh, prosecutor, a very shrewd older gentleman, he stands up and he says, ladies and gentlemen, let me explain circumstantial evidence to you. He says, my grandmother used to make homemade biscuits. And so she would get up in the morning and she made them from scratch. Does that, does that translate here too? Okay. So she would get out the flour and the, the butter and the milk and she would mix it all up and she would make biscuits and hand pat them out and put them in the oven. And he said, one morning she goes in to make her biscuits and when she gets the bag of flour, she takes it off the shelf of the cupboard and flour runs out all over the counter. And she looks and there's a hole in the corner of the bag. And she looks up on the shelf and there's little brown droppings all over the shelf and little chewed up pieces of paper. That's circumstantial evidence that there's a mouse. She didn't see the mouse, but, well, actually, he said a rat. He said, that's circumstantial evidence of a rat. And he, he says, she didn't see the rat, but she knows 100% of the time she has a rat in her house, and she's going to have to put out a trap and catch this rat. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, there's a rat in this courtroom, and he's sitting right over there. <laughs> and so, uh, but the jury understood that. That made sense about what is circumstantial evidence. So it's important that you understand Direct evidence versus circumstantial evidence. Yep, they got it. So we talk about the Gospels. You want to talk about the, the, the Gospel account of the life of, of this guy named Jesus. And so one thing we're going to look at is the Gospel writers are eyewitnesses. Now, I don't want to get too off, too far into the weeds or too far into a rabbit hole um, because there's a lot of research that you can do on this and has been done on this, and I, and I recommend that you do this. Um, some of the argument has been made that, well, the Gospels were written too far after Jesus' death, so they couldn't be eyewitness accounts. Some people say they're written 30 years later. Some people say they're written 60, 70 years later. Um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight. I've looked at the research. I think they were probably written in the 30-year part. So here's what I would say to you. This is a, 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 probably the easiest way I can explain this. If you asked me what I did on November 16th of 2010, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I probably had dinner with my wife. And the reason is that's my anniversary. So if I didn't have dinner with my wife, I was probably in trouble. And I've been married to the same woman for 27 years, so I know don't make a rookie mistake. Take my wife out on our anniversary. Um, but if you ask me what was I doing on November 16th of 1991, I can tell you exactly, because that's the day I got married. So that was an event in my life that I remember. I, Georgia played Auburn that day, and we won. <laughs> so I know that. Uh, but I know what I wore. I know where I had my meal beforehand. I know I met my family at the hotel and all the things that went into that, because that was a significant event. So does that mean, well, because I'm recalling that from 25 or 30 years ago, does that mean I'm wrong in my recollection? No, I can recall that with great detail. So you have to look at what are the events that are being documented. The writers identify themselves. And so I, I put the, if you want to go look at the Bible, see what it says. Like Peter identifies himself as a witness to the sufferings of Christ. John identifies himself as the disciple who was testifying to these things and wrote these things. You know, so John's saying, I saw them and I wrote them down. Um, and uh, 1 John 1, 1 states, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. So the writers are explaining, this is where, this is our point of view. This is where we're writing from. Sometimes we're writing things in first person. Sometimes we're writing things in third person. Um, and the writers in the, in the Gospels are kind of laying this out for us. And in Peter's very first sermon at Pentecost, he told the crowd that the disciples were all witnesses of the facts of the resurrection. And so we're going to talk more about what are the witnesses of the resurrection? What does that mean? What did they see? What can we, we draw from that? All right, so we have the big question, right? What happened to Jesus? Um, we have to start with some basic understanding, some basic, um, hopefully, some facts that I think everybody here should be in agreement with. And if you're not in agreement with them, that's okay. Um, we're going to kind of run through those and make sure we're all starting. So we're gonna, how do we explain the empty tomb? So Jesus was tried, convicted, crucified, placed in a tomb. Three days later, the body's gone. 
And so now there's a, you know, the question of what happened. Did the disciples steal the body? So there's lots of theories that are out there. And this is what happens when you start getting into that, the scientific side of it. Well, if I only believe things in the natural realm, that everything has to have a natural order and everything has to have a law of science, then I have to come up with an explanation that explains that set of facts that fits within that bias that I have that it can only be based on scientific fact. Uh, was Jesus only injured on the cross and then recovered later? That's one of the theories. Jesus didn't actually die. He was on the cross. He was crucified. He was beaten. He was tortured. Uh, yeah, I just learned today you guys have a museum of torture here. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> also, who, who thought that up? You know, and then are they making money? I mean, because like, wow. But yeah, so, so one of the arguments is, well, he never died. So then he passed out, went into shock. He was taken down from the cross, placed into the tomb. Um, and then sometime over the next three days, he recovered consciousness and he came out of the tomb. And that explains the resurrection. So that gives you a nice package that you're going, okay, yeah, I get it now. So the guy didn't actually raise from the dead, but I can, it explains it away. And so we want to look at, you know, some of these. And we're not going to look at all of these tonight. We'll be here all night. I know you don't want to do that. Um, or you might want to. And I'd love to talk about it all night. But, um, but at some point we have to eat. And so we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> So I didn't get this figure by missing meals. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about a couple of these different theories. We're going to kind of break them down as we would as a homicide investigator. Um, so did he actually die and resurrect from the dead? And let's apply some abductive reasoning to this. Okay, so these are the basic accepted facts. And if you, again, for our discussion tonight, I'm going to assume you, we're going to accept these. If you don't want to accept these, that's fine. I'm not, you don't have to. Um, but Jesus died and was buried. That's kind of number one. We're going to talk about the resurrection. Jesus' tomb was empty and no one ever produced his body. Because there's no body of Jesus that we know of. Jesus' disciples believed they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. So whether they saw him or not, they believed that they did. They wrote about it. They documented it. Jesus' disciples were transformed following their alleged resurrection observations. After they saw Jesus they were emboldened. They were out spreading the gospel. They were ministering and that kind of stuff. So there was a change in their attitude and behavior from, oh, this guy we've been hanging around has now been tried, convicted, and crucified. And they were very distraught at that point. And then all of a sudden, they're all hot, happy, fired up, ready to go again. So there was a change in their behavior during that time period. All right, so let's talk about death, um, which unfortunately I, I'm kind of an expert in. Because um, in my job, I see a lot of dead people. And you have to think about first century humans. Um, they didn't have funeral homes. So if someone in your family died, what happened to that person? Anybody know? Who prepared the body of a family member when they died? Family. family. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it worked. Um, they didn't have grocery stores. I find that hard to believe. No consum. Right? <laughs> so well, we go every day while we're here. Um, so if they wanted meat, where did they get meat? They hunt. They hunt. They kill a goat. They kill a, a sheep, a deer, whatever they need. They clean the animal. Okay. So first century humans understood what death looked like, what it smelled like. And I don't want to be overly graphic, but death has a smell. Death has a look and appearance. There are just certain things about it. Roman soldiers were experts in death, because what was their job? Kill people, right? I mean, it's the military now. What's your job being in the military? Kill people and break things. Like, and so that's what they did. So Roman soldiers were really good at killing people. So if you look at this, this theory that, well, he didn't really die. That didn't happen. So you have to talk about a couple of things. What are some signs and symptoms of death? What are things that we look for as a crime scene investigator that we would expect to see? This one here... Um, Anybody know what we're illustrating with this? This person is dead. What? Yeah, what? <laughs> they don't look dead, right? They are, I promise. All right, so obviously we're going to check for a pulse, right? We're going to check for breathing, you know, response to pain. We do something called a sternal rub where we touch our knuckles and we rub it on their sternum. You know, if we see somebody that we think is unconscious, unresponsive, because this is painful if you do that. If you do a sternal rub and they're not dead, they're going to usually ow or sit up or they'll at least pull their arms in. There'll be some response to that pain. 
So they're going to know, hey, somebody's dead. They're, you know, they're not going to be responsive. They're not going to be able to talk to me. They're not breathing. I'm seeing their chest moving in and out. They didn't have the medical knowledge that we have, but these are things that they would know. Um, temperature loss, right? We're all somewhere in the ballpark of, and I, don't, I can't translate in my head to um, Celsius, so bear with me, 98.6. Um, 36. 36, yeah. So we're all, you know, around that temperature, and here it's much hotter than that right now, at least it is to me. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you touch somebody and they're cold, that, that's a clue, right? Something's not right. Um, rigor mortis. This is what we're looking at down here. This is rigor mortis. Rigor mortis, or sometimes called post-mortem rigor, is when the muscles all stiffen up in the body. Rigor mortis sets in usually within an hour of death, um, and it can last up to... 36 hours, depending on the temperature and the size of the person. There's a lot of factors that go into that. You have probably seen this if you're driving out of the city somewhere out in the country and you see a dog or a cow or something that's dead on the side of the road, their feet are sticking straight up in the air. Okay? That's rigor mortis. Um, so again, if Jesus is on the cross and he's dead and they take him down off the cross, these are things that they would be noticing, they would see. Or they would notice the absence of these things. So, hey, this isn't there. This doesn't make sense to me. All right, I said Roman soldiers are very familiar with death. We already talked about that. All right, so this is post-mortem lividity. I don't know how well you guys can see that. Um, some of you would be glad you can see, probably. So what happens is when your heart stops beating, blood pools to the lowest point of your body because of gravity. I mean, this kind of makes sense. So when the blood pools, it infuses into the cells, into the tissues in that area, and it causes this, like, purplish-red staining. So... This individual is dead, so you can see all this dark, kind of purple-red color. That is post-mortem lividity. That's what happens when you die. Now, on this particular individual, the upper area of the shoulders are still white. We call that blanching because the, the shoulders were laying against the ground, and the ground compresses the capillaries, so the blood can't flow into those areas. So the areas that are in contact with the ground or in contact with a wall or something, they won't change. They'll, they'll keep the normal skin color, but the other areas will turn very dark. Lividity, once it goes into the body, it's fixed. It doesn't change. It doesn't move. So for us in the crime scene world, that helps us determine if the body is in the same position at the scene as the time of death. So like when I roll this gentleman over, if he's face down and I see all this lividity, that, I, that tells me if he was face down and somebody has moved him after death because that lividity should be on his back. He should be faced up based on what I'm seeing here. So it's a method that we use in crime scene to help position bodies. So once again, I don't know how much the Romans would understand about positioning the body, but they would know what lividity looks like. They would have seen it many, many times. So again, it's something that you would expect to see um, when you're moving a body that is deceased. All right, so John 19, 32 through 34, says the soldiers came, broke the legs of the first, and then the other who was crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and out gushed blood and water. So this is John's account of what happened. So John's recording this, this information. And to me, this is a really interesting passage to look at. There's a couple of things that are going on here. So the Roman soldiers have determined that the other two that were being crucified with Jesus are dead. It doesn't say how they made that determination. But they've somehow made that determination. Uh, or actually, they made a determination they weren't dead, and they broke their legs to make sure that they were gonna, going to die. Uh, so what happens to a Roman soldier if they're given the task of carrying out an execution and the person survives? Anybody know? Yeah, they get executed. That was the deal. So they generally are not going to mess this up. Uh, so they're going to break the guy's legs. When they get to Jesus, they're like, oh, well, that guy's already dead. So my guess is, and this is completely me just, you know, I've been a cop a long time. I've hung around cops. The Romans were soldiers, cops. That was all kind of one thing back in the day. So this is what I'm guessing. There's always one cop around that doesn't believe what the other cops are saying. You know, and they're like, nah, that dude's dead. Don't worry about it. And it's like, here, give me my spear. You know, let me, let me poke him a couple times. Let me just make sure because I'm not going to get hung up on the cross because I messed up. And that's my, my theory of what happened. John didn't record that, but that's just, you know, that's just Jeff's, you know, hanging around cops. So anyway, he takes it, pierces the side of the spear, and then John writes, out came blood and water. So what is the significance of that? Why does that mean something to us? If you're an investigator, what, what is that telling you? 
He was still alive. Yeah. Okay, you say that he was still alive. My argument is that tells me that he was dead. And here's why. One of the things we look for is pain compliance, right? How's it going to feel if somebody pokes you in the side of the spear? <laughs> so if you're still alive, you're probably going to wince. You're going to cry out in pain. You know, something to that effect. Secondly, and the other thing is water. Why does water come out? If I poke you in the lung right now, I'm probably going to see blood be my guess. Everybody agree with that? So you have to ask yourself, why does water come out? And John probably would not know this because his medical knowledge at the time was somewhat limited. But there is a, uh, a medical condition called pleural effusion. Are there any medical students in here? Anybody? I know I got Reagan, who's a nurse. You guys talk about pleural effusion? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, she's like, I don't know what I do those. Um, you know where the pleura is, right? Anatomy, physiology, right? So the pleura is the lining of the lungs. And when you have severe trauma, the body starts flooding fluid into those areas. That's why you get swelling and that, or edema, as we call it. And so sometimes the sac around the lung will get filled with fluid. It fills up with water. This is an x-ray of pleural effusion. So the white area here is water. It's liquid. This is what your lung should look like. So this person's right lung is okay. Their left lung is about halfway filled up with water. So if you pierce that with a sword, what are you going to get with a spear? You're going to get blood and water. So it's very interesting that John recorded that particular specific fact. Uh, I don't know why he recorded it, but as an investigator, that's important to me because then that's a that's a sign of this pleural effusion, which is again pain compliance. He didn't, you know, there's no document that Jesus cried out in pain. Jesus moved. He poked him. Blood and water ran out. So and there's also pericardial effusion. You have this happen in your heart as well. Sac around your heart will do the same. All right, so the water was certainly pouring out of his body if he was pierced with a spear. All right, let's talk a little bit about eyewitness testimony. So a lot of people say, well, you can't believe the Gospels because these are Jesus' people. They're writing about him, and so they're going to write what he wants them to write, and they're going to support him and that kind of stuff. There are a lot of first century unfriendly Roman and Jewish, Jewish sources that affirm that Jesus was crucified and died. So, and these are some of them. We're not going to go to all the Thallus, Tactus, um, the, I said a lot of folks documented it. At my Greek and Roman is worse than my Croatian, if that's possible. Um, so there are a lot of folks who documented the life and death of Jesus independent of the four gospel authors. So it's not as if we're taking one source. Because you know, if you're doing research, what do they tell you? They'll, your, your, your professors will tell you they want more than one source, right? And Wikipedia can't be one of them. Right? That's what we get told in the U.S. all the time. Come and use Wikipedia. Um, and so you have to have multiple sources. So we have multiple sources that are confirming that this particular event occur occurred. Roman guards faced death. They allowed the prisoner to survive. We talked about that. To survive the beatings, Jesus would have had to control his blood loss. Okay? How do you control your blood loss if your hands and feet are nailed to a cross? You know, so it's very difficult to address and poke the spear aside. Blood's running out of his side, but his hands are nailed to a cross. So now he didn't have the ability, you know... Those of you on the medical side, what, what do you do for bleeding? What's the first, first aid that you apply for bleeding? Pressure. Direct pressure. There you go. Yeah, you guys know. There's no direct pressure here. So on top of beating, crown of thorns on your head, spikes driven through your feet, driven through your hands, I now have a, what we call an incised wound or a puncture wound that is now bleeding that has to be addressed. So none of that was possible to do this. So the whole theory of, eh, he didn't really die. You know, it's getting less. We start taking our approach as a abductive reasoner, and you start looking at, okay, what are the, you know, what are the series of facts that I have to look at, and what is the most reasonable, logical result? It starts getting less and less that, oh, he didn't die. All right, Jesus displayed wounds following the resurrection, but was never observed to behave as though he was wounded. So to me, this was kind of interesting as well. So if the theory is, he died, he didn't die, he just passed out, went into shock. They took him down, they prepared his body, they put him in the grave. So that means we're having to overlook the post-mortem lividity, we're overlooking the rigor mortis, we're overlooking the blood loss, uh, we're overlooking the he's not responsive to pain, we're skipping all, we're, all that aside. Um, we put him in the grave and he wakes up, he recovers, comes back to consciousness in three days, and he appears to everybody, but he never is documented appearing wounded. Now, how are you going to be walking as you come out of that grave after having a nail driven through your feet? 
You know, how are your hands going to be? What's your side going to look like? You've been pierced. You've been beaten. You know, but there's no, there's no documentation that, oh, we saw him three days later, but man, he looked bad. You know, <laughs> this guy, you know, that's not, that's not in the record anywhere. Um, and even Thomas, one of the other's own, you know, you've heard doubting Thomas. Even Thomas, one of the apostles, is like, uh, let me see your hands. Let me see your side. I don't believe this, you know. Um, so Jesus never displayed any evidence of, you know, appeared as if he was wounded. And then, this is interesting to me as well. Jesus disappeared from the historical record following his reported resurrection and ascension and was never cited again. Jesus just drops off the, the face of the earth, no pun intended, but I mean, he's just gone. Um, no documents. Now, here's a guy that the Jews and the Romans arrested, tried, crucified publicly, and if he survived, is he just going to disappear? No one's going to document, oh, hey, yeah, man, I saw him living down the road a little ways in a little shack, you know, selling peanuts on the side of the road. Um, yeah, there's no historical record beyond the ascension. Um, so that's an interesting, you know, interesting thing with the whole theory of, well, he didn't really die, then where did he go? What happened to this person of Jesus? There's also the conspiracy theory. And this is one we hear a lot, that the... Um, the disciples made up the story about what happened to Jesus. They made up the whole resurrection thing. Um, and the conspiracy theory is uh, it, it's pretty cool to me because I've worked conspiracies as, a, as an investigator. Um, I love a conspiracy as, a, as an investigator, homicide or you know financial, whatever it is, I don't care. Because here's the great thing about a conspiracy. The fastest way to get caught is to do what? Anybody know? What's the fastest way for you to get caught if you commit a crime? Around. Stick around. That's one. Return to the crime scene, I guess. Return to the crime scene, even, even more so than that. Tell somebody. You tell somebody what you did, now that person can give you up, right? And this may sound very sexist, and I apologize. I uh, apologize in advance. But my best friend in a homicide investigation is the ex-girlfriend. <laughs> the guy's former girlfriend, she will give him up in a second if she's mad at him about whatever it is he did. You know? And I'm like, come on in, have a seat. What do you got to say? You know? And she's like, he has a gun and he keeps it under his bed and it's right next to his drugs. And they'll tell you all kinds of stuff. You know? <laughs> Great. Um, so for a conspiracy to work, you have to have multiple people involved. The more people involved, the less likely this conspiracy is going to survive because somebody's going to talk. Then the other thing that happens is when, when the heat comes, and we use the term heat, does that make the same translation here, the heat, like when the police start you know, putting pressure on you? When the heat comes, somebody's going to tell on somebody else to get out of trouble. And that's just how that works. We call it flipping. You know, oh, I'm going to flip his roommate, and his roommate's going to give him up. And that's, you know, we, we love that in the police side of things in conspiracy. Um, the, uh, when, uh, Warner, who wrote the book, the Cold Case Christianity book, he describes a, uh, a case in, in his book where they have a homicide in California. And it was, uh, two guys decided they're going to rob someone walking down the street and the guy resists. They end up in a fight and they stab him and kill him. Stab him one time, but it was a fatal stab wound and the guy dies. The entire event was captured on a camera at a bank. But the problem was the camera was far enough away that it was kind of blurry and you couldn't really identify the individual. But you could see the shirt. It was a green and black plaid shirt that one of the suspects was wearing. Um, so through good police work and, and detective work, they developed some suspects. Those two guys, roommates, lived together. They go over and they pick the two guys up. Well, when you arrest two suspects together, the first thing we do in the police world is we separate them. Because we don't want them comparing stories. We don't want them talking to one another. Because that's a problem. So we separate them. So they take the two suspects. They put one in one room and one in the other room. And the detective goes in to the bigger guy. Who he thinks most fits the, the profile of the guy in the video. So he says, I think this is my killer. He looked like the, the bigger guy wearing the green and black shirt. So I think that's my guy. So he goes in first and talks to him. Now, in the United States... The police are allowed to lie to a suspect. Um, it's not against the law. Um, now, there's only certain things we can lie about, but we can lie to a suspect about what kind of evidence we have. Uh, is, you call it a bluff. If you play cards, you know what bluffing is. And, you know, we can bluff. You have to be very careful because it can get you in trouble. Uh, you can't lie about the law. You can't say, oh, if you confess to this, you know, it's really only like a parking violation and then charge them with murder. <laughs> um, yeah, you can't do that. 
So, uh, but again, we can lie about you know particular evidence of the crime. So what the detective do? They go inside. And they tell the bigger guy, "Hey, we're talking to your roommate down the hall, and then he gave you up. He told us where that green and black plaid shirt is. We're gonna find blood on that shirt. You know we are." Um, and the guy says, "Man, that's not even my shirt." He goes, "He bought me that shirt uh, as a gift, but he wears it all the time. I don't ever wear it." Detective says, "All right, thanks. I'll be right back." Well, they never talked to the first guy yet. So he goes down the hall and talks to the first guy and says, hey, I just talked to your roommate, and he told me about the green and black shirt, told me you bought it for him as a gift, but then you ended up keeping it yourself. Now, murder's a pretty serious crime, and I know that's going to have blood on it. And the guy down the hall says, man, he was wearing the shirt. And, you know, now, here it goes. And they end up solving a murder because you can't make the conspiracy stick. Um, and when it comes down to who's going to go to jail, somebody's going to start talking. So think about 12 disciples trying to put together a conspiracy to say that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, the interesting thing about that, too, is you're talking about motives. What are the motives? Why do people do things? Anybody know what the motives for crime are? We talked about this Monday. Anybody was here Monday? Give me a, a motive. Money. Money, yeah, that's a big one, right? Greed, we call it. We put greed as one biggie. It could be money, it could be things, whatever. What else? Revenge. Revenge, yeah, huge motive. Revenge. What else? An idea, I would guess. Great stuff. What's that? An idea by itself? Yeah, not really a motive just to have an idea. Usually there's a reason for the idea. What am I trying to accomplish? So money, greed, lust is a biggie. Passion, lust, that kind of stuff. Drugs. Drugs is a huge one. Yeah, we see that a lot. People commit crimes with drugs. Sex. Okay, sex. Did you follow the lust area? So if you look at all the, the motives that are out there, what are the motives for the disciples to make up a story that this guy, Jesus, was raised from the dead? What does it get them? Fame? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Did they get fame? Yeah. Did anybody know what, what happened to the disciples eventually? Yeah, they were all murdered. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so you start looking at motive going, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with motive on this one. I have a problem finding with a logical motive. I mean, the disciples were martyred. They were killed for what they said. And then the interesting thing about it is not one of them ever came off and said, okay, wait a minute, whoa, 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 we just made something up. <laughs> you know, hang on, before you cut my head off, before you, you know, put me on a cross like you did Jesus, let me, let me know, look, this thing wasn't true. Not one of them gave that up. And then also you have in the historical record that there were 500 people who claimed they were witnesses to Jesus after, the, after his death, that they witnessed the resurrection. So you would have to have 500 participants in a giant conspiracy uh, and everybody would have to, to hold on to that same story for the whole conspiracy theory side of it to work. All right, so you have to come up with a verdict, right? So we go to a trial, we have a jury, we present evidence, and we want to get a verdict from our jury. We want to go to the jury and say, okay, tell us, what do you draw, what conclusion are you drawing from all of this? So, again, we, we're, we're kind of going through this fairly quickly tonight. Um, but if you look at it, and my challenge to you is I want to challenge you, don't believe what I say. You know, um, do the research yourself. You know, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. I'll be steer your directions, but look for yourself. You know, one of the one of the biblical truths is you will know people, you know, by their fruit. You know, by what they produce. Um, so look at what are people trying to get out of it. What are they trying to get from you? Um, you know, Dami said that we, uh, you know, we're not asking you for money. I'm not trying to get anything, which I didn't know I was getting paid. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah. No. So, yeah, we want to look at, you know, you know people by their fruit. What is it, you know, what do the disciples want? They wanted, you know, they wanted to, 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 to preach to people. They wanted to heal the sick. They wanted to feed the, the masses. Um, these are the things they were doing. They weren't asking for money. They weren't running for office. They weren't trying to get elected, you know. So you start looking at, you know, what, what, what do they gain out of all this? So the verdict, you have to ask yourself, if Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven as the eyewitnesses reported, then that means he's alive today. You have to be able to take that leap from, am I willing to say that there's not a scientific, natural explanation that is probable? You know, defense attorneys, their favorite thing is to ask you a question, is it possible? I get this on the stand all the time, all the stand testifying. And they'll stand up there and they'll say, Officer Brandon, is it possible that the drugs in my client's underwear were placed there by someone other than my client? You know, and I'll be like, well, it may be possible unless someone else hid the dope in your client's underwear. 
What is more probable is your client has four previous you know, drug convictions and he put the drugs in his underwear so we wouldn't find them. You know? So I'm not really interested in what's possible. I'm looking at what is probable. Um, yeah, you got a lot of defense attorneys up that come up with some of the crazy. Any law students in here? We were at the law school today talking to some folks today. I love talking to law students. Um, so we're at the law school talking to students today. I had a, a case where I had a victim that was shot in the head. And he was lying on a pillow. And I was testifying about the crime scene. And I was making reference to the blood stain on the pillow. And the defense attorney objected. He says, Your Honor, we object. Um, he says, do we have a chemical test to tell us that that was blood on the pillow? And so the lawyer asked me, do we have a chemical test? I said, no, sir, I did not test the blood. He says, well, we make a motion in limine. A motion in limine is a, uh, a legal move that basically says, we're going to limit you from saying certain things. So he says, we file a motion in limine that Officer Brandon cannot use the word blood. We don't know what the substance is. He can't just immediately look at any substance and tell us what it is. So just based on his own observations, without any chemical test, laboratory test to back this up, we, we, we refuse to allow him to use the word blood. So he can refer to this as the reddish-brown stain. So then the judge looks at me and says, Officer, do you understand? I'm like, yes, sir, I understand. So I said, well, there was a reddish-brown stain on the pillow, and I go through the rest of my testimony. So when the prosecutor stands up, they have what's called redirect. The prosecutor goes first, then the defense, then the prosecutor gets to go again. So in redirect, the prosecutor says, Officer Brandon, why didn't you test the reddish-brown stain? And I said, well, he had a hole in his head, and red stuff was running out of it. I was pretty confident of two things, that it was blood and that it was his. And I don't think I need a test to tell me that. You know? And the jury started laughing. <laughs> they were like, yeah, it makes sense to us. So lawyers have all kinds of tricks that they try to play with evidence to try to twist the meaning. And what you, you know, if you've got a, head, a hole in your head and the rest of running out of it, if it's something other than blood, I really want to see that. Because um, I don't know what that's going to be. The other thing is, so if Jesus is who he said he was, and he's in heaven today, then he's God, right? That, that's, you know, as we approach the Easter season, that's the, that's the logical conclusion of, hey, I'm who I said I am. This is, puts me in this position. So the conclusion that Jesus was resurrected, resurrected can be sensibly inferred from the available evidence. So if you start digging into the evidence, you look at the Gospels, you look at the eyewitness testimonies, you look at the documents of what happened, you look at the medical evidence that we know today, and apply that technology to the time period, you can infer that there's not another probable, there's not another reasonable explanation. This is the most reasonable explanation. I've been a crime scene investigator, I've said, for 27 years. I can tell you, I had to come to this conclusion at some point in my life as well. Um, and I looked at it, I'm like, hey, I don't see another plausible explanation. I don't see the whole, oh, it's a conspiracy, or they lied, or it's all about money, you know, that kind of stuff. If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and he's who he said he was, then you have to ask yourself. And this is, a, this is an interesting, interesting question that we pose to people here. Do you believe in him as your savior? So it's a, um, let me just look to the next slide. I think I put this in here. Yeah. So this goes to the difference in the belief that or the belief in, um, which is kind of an interesting thing. I had never really thought about it in, th in these terms before. So you can believe that something is true, but do you actually believe in it? Do you actually take it to heart? So here's the example. Every morning I get up and go to work, uh, I put on a uniform. Um, I put on a uniform, I put on a gun belt, and I've got a radio and a taser, a flashlight, and gun, and extra ammunition, and all the things that go on to a police uniform. I have a badge, my name tag. But one of the first pieces of equipment that I put on is a bulletproof vest. Um, and so we have, um, do the officers here wear bulletproof vests? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So we wear them every day in the United States. In the United States, we have a lot more guns, a lot more violence. People like to shoot the police. Um, and so we wear vests to work every day. So it's part of it. So I get up every day, I put on a vest. I put on a vest that has my blood type printed on the front. It says A positive. So if I get shot, then they know what kind of blood to give me. Hopefully keep me alive because I like meat. Um, <laughs> and so the, uh, the, when, uh, when Warner uh, Wallace was writing this book, he was telling the story of one of his colleagues. An officer stopped a guy on the street, um, was trying to do a, what we call a pat-down search just to make sure the guy didn't have any weapons or drugs on him. And as he started to pat down, the guy pulls out a handgun, pulls out a 45 caliber handgun, and starts moving it, pointing it towards him. The officer realizes at that moment, I'm going to get shot. This guy has a gun. He's coming towards me. I'm going to draw my gun, but 
action is faster than reaction. So by the time I react and get my hand to my gun and get my gun on target, I'm, I'm getting shot. That's probably getting ready to happen. So he draws his gun and he tells us, he's telling the story, he says, I tense up my abdomen knowing here it comes. You know, this guy's getting ready to shoot me. And in that moment, he had to not believe that a vest would stop, to stop a bullet. He had to believe in his vest, right? Because <laughs> if this vest doesn't work, I'm done. And fortunately, he lives to tell us the story because he gets shot. He draws his weapon, shoots back, and he survives because his vest does his job. So he's willing to put his faith in that vest, his life in that vest. So that's the question that we have to get to, I think, as, as people that are, if we're digging into this guy, Jesus Christ, and who is he? You know, it's one thing to go, okay, I believe that he lived. I believe that he was crucified. I believe that he died. And see, even say, I believe that he rose from the dead. Um, but do I believe in him? Do I believe that, hey, this guy is my way to heaven? This guy is my way to change my life? And that's the question that you have to ask yourself. And so that's the challenge that I want to put to you is dig deep. You're, you know, most of you are college students in this room. Ask yourself, hey, do I just listen to what my professors tell me and just accept that the well, that's the truth? Or am I willing to dig into that? Uh, professors don't like it when you question them, right? <laughs> you know, I just finished a master's degree, so I just got out of college. I went back to college 20 years later, and I, I'm crazy. Um, and it's much harder to learn in your 50s than in your like 20s. Um, but yeah, you, so you have to ask yourself the question, am I willing to take that step that I believe that this happened and go to I believe in him? Uh, and that's the challenge. I can tell you this, the Americans that are here on the team with me this week, they believe in him. I know them because I've heard their stories. I've heard all of them tell their story about their life and the change that's made in their life. And so change starts here. I've talked to many of you in this room throughout this week, and you'll, most of you have heard me say that. If you're going to see a change in your country, if you're going to see a change in the way that we relate to one another, that change is going to start with you. It's going to start with the young people in this room. It's not going to start with the leaders in the country. They're going to do what they do, right? They're fixed and set in their ways. It starts here. And so if you want to see change here, my challenge is start digging deep into what do you believe, what do you know, and do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, or are you going to believe in Jesus? And that's what I've got. So, um, Dami, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm here the rest of the night. Uh, we're here tomorrow. We're here Saturday. I'm going to grow Saturday. If you want to have, if you want to talk, please come talk to me. If you want to talk about spiritual things, about, hey, I want to know about this Jesus and how do I find out about this guy, talk to these Americans that are here. I'm telling you, these people know. I'll be happy to talk to you as well. Um, if you want to talk about guns and dead bodies and crime scenes and car chases, come talk to me too because I like that stuff. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy to do that. But we're here for you. If anything I can do to help, that's why I'm here. Right.